Good evening and a very warm welcome to you all. Welcome to Designing Cities for All, another episode. And it's part of our two year long activity and research program in which we take a deep dive into designing products, places and systems for all, very inclusive. This live cast of today is part of a series of three live casts called the Identity. And these live casts are co-curated by Designing Cities for All fellow Leongo Juliana, who joins me here at the table. A very warm welcome to you again. You. This is the last part, the last episode that you're my co-host. Actually, you're the main host and I'm just the co-host to introduce the stuff. <laughs> That's the reality of it all. You've enough invited several amazing guests. Uh, they all belong to my personal favorites. I will tell you a little bit more about that. But first, Leongo, uh, I'm going to ask you a question about the previous episode, but I would like to invite people who are watching as well to participate in the program. If you have some questions that you would like to ask our panel, that is possible. If you go to the program page of Pakhuis de Zwijger, there you can log into Zoom and through the Q&A function, you can ask questions to everybody who joins in the conversation here. Um, and make sure that you mention who the question is directed to so I can make sure the right question is aimed to the right person. Leongo, good to have you again for the final time. Um, the previous episode focused on human identity. Um, what was your personal main takeaway of that episode? Uh, well, it, it, it was. I had different takeaways from the different speakers we had, and it was very inspirational the way um, Arna Makic mm -hmm. uh, was was able to to turn around a very negative experience in in her youth of exclusion, and that defined her and and gave her this 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 urge to make inclusive uh, architecture or to go into architecture and make it inclusive and in that way make a change. Um, Just I a little context, Anna was a refugee who came here with exactly. a family yes. but turned that around to design more inclusive for everybody. Exactly, exactly. And also Ali um, also in inspired me very much with, you know, his designs for places of worship mm -hmm. where he... Um, he took away the strong uh, traditional symbolism and in that way was able to make the, the, the place of worship more inclusive. So it's not only for that certain group of people, that certain religion, but that others also feel welcome to, to, to go to, to that place. So I thought that was very, very interesting, especially... You turned that, that into a place of gathering? A place of gathering instead of just a place of worship. And yeah. I think that is very strong. And of course, uh, Isaline also... Um, um, with her music, um, which inspired us, but also, um, you know, being able to create her own kind of music, her own contemporary music, and still so recognizable as Kurosalinian. So, um, yes, that was very, very inspiring, and also that, that we saw the similarities between music and uh, architecture. Yeah, because in the striptych, it's very important for you that we included music. Yeah. Why is music so important? Well, well, in, in the music, I hear what I would like to design, and and since um, what I what what I try to, to to design as an architect, there's not not, not so many examples of that. Uh, specifically, let's say the questions that we have now in the cities like Amsterdam, Rotterdam, and De Hague, with these super diverse cities, um, people are afraid that I am talking about creating different neighborhoods for different ethnic groups or for different different groups. It's not about that. It's about creating. Uh, this this new architecture where everybody feels at home but you know th and that's what it's going to be about today you know experience we all experience the city in a different way but how do we make sure as architects that we design cities in such a way that e everyone ha can get this feeling of belonging this feeling that they are at home in that in in their city mm. it, it, could that be a parallel parallel to be made by um by the theory of Ali uh, Manjera, where he designs not a place of worship, but a place of gathering as well. Exactly. Will neighborhoods be a place of gathering where people from several denominators, several backgrounds can come together and coexist and live together happily ever after? Yeah, I, th I, think, I think definitely. I, I mean, I would... Uh, if, you know, he, he designed a, a mosque, uh, and, and I, I think it's... it's it is such a beautiful design that that i guess everybody would like to have that in their neighborhood you know and and it, so it's not about 
a religious building, it's about the architecture. And what happens here is that the moment you, you talk about the mosque, it's just about the, the fact that it is a symbol of a certain religion. We only discuss about that, but we don't discuss the architecture and the, I mean, it's, it's one of the buildings I would still like, love to do. It's mm. a place of worship because it's so specific. And, and if you look at the architectural history, you know, we deal a lot with places of worship in, by which we teach architecture, the history of architecture. Mm. Um, today, the main uh, topic is the human experience. Yes. Uh, why is it made to be the main topic? What, do you, what would you like to achieve in this program? In regard to human experience, well, it, it's twofold. It's it's it's. Uh, I would like to 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 open people's eyes of how maybe the group uh, or that they don't belong to might experience the city in a different way. So open eyes that different people and experience the city in a different way. And how do you make sure that they all get a place within that city? Um, it, it, it's about that, and it's about how do you create architecture. Uh, for that certain experience that you want people to to, to have, so th that's the the, the, the twofold uh, where I would like to concentrate on today. And we've got a clip from Olutumena Digbe, who was a guest in our previous episodes, and she talks about human uh, design, design that uh, that is inclusive, but also that inclusivity is not always in are in people's nature. Let's have a look at the clip. Is that inclusion happens by design or not at all? So inclusion and belonging have become buzzwords, if you may, in modern times, everybody's talking about what it means to be diverse and what it means to be inclusive. But the truth of the matter is that unless deliberate strategic action is taken to foster inclusion. It doesn't just happen because human beings are both self-centered and tribalistic, which means that on the individual and on the social level, it is not our natural inclination to keep our social spaces inclusive. If we then want to think about what urban spaces which are shared by default mean for people in them, then we have to think about what it means to translate a shared space into an inclusive space. And in doing that, we have to think about what the culture that we're trying to foster is. What kind of message are we sending to the people who already exist in the space? What kind of people are we trying to invite into the space? What kind of work are we willing to do to make sure that the people we want in this space are cared for, have their needs met, are able to access resources and opportunities and power at equitable levels. Because I think we can admit that the concept of equality is very appealing in theory, but very difficult to execute in real life. And so we need to move away from thinking about equal access and start thinking about equitable access because we don't all experience shared spaces in the same way. Just as human identity is subjective, human experiences are also subjective. And depending on our social location or economic location, depending on class, depending on race, depending on so many attributes that determine our experience of the world, we will experience shared spaces differently. Yes, yeah, very, very interesting. Human experiences are subjective. That's, uh, of course, an eye-opener that we have to take into account when we talk about inclusive design. But it's also interesting that uh, that she said it's not a nature, uh, it's not a natural inclination to keep our social spaces inclusive. So it's it is a social space. It's a shared space, but it's not always in inclusive. Those two ideas. How can you resolve that? Because like uh, like well, like we heard uh, people are selfish in a way and tribalistic yeah well it, it starts by recognizing that 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 we are that way as human beings and then you can you can act in a different way if, if you get that you know if you get that idea that you have to look at okay that's why for instance uh, what I do when I start with a project in a certain area I, I start to look at the demographics so that I don't start thinking from what I think it is, but just look at the demographics and, and see what, 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 what 
kind of people are there mm. and that uh, living there um, what ages what what gender etc cetera, etc cetera. and that that gives you some information uh, to start and maybe it will trigger you and and you know talk to people of that neighborhood uh, walk around to not to because we have a tendency to design in areas without ever having walked there and i think the main way to to get a feeling of a place is by walking through it right um you've invited uh Three guests, and yes. two of them I will introduce right now because we are joined, again, like I said, by two favorites of mine, and the third is my favorite as well, so it's going to be a treat tonight. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, the first guest that I would like to introduce to you joins me here at the table. Uh, it's Susan, architect and founder of Mechanou. Uh, Francine Huben, a very warm welcome to you. Um, we've met before when you were a guest here in the Zwijger uh, for Dutch Masters, and then you were on the brink to begin uh, the 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 the, the The, the reworking of the uh, library, the Martin Luther King Jr. Library. Oh, yeah. And we talk about inclusive spaces. It was a space which you, uh, that, you, that you explained that had several functions. People who would like to take out books, of course, but also the homeless people found room in the lobby there, but they needed electricity. That's something that I, I remembered as well because they, they went online, so they had to have Wi-Fi access, but also families had to be there and the neighborhood um, the, it had to be included as well, as well as the architectural history because um, the library was designed by Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. Yes. So how can you be inclusive if you have all the groups that uh, are present there and it's finished now? Did you succeed? Yes, we. Uh, I we did succeed. It's uh, it's finished. It's not really the grand opening. We expect after COVID in um, September or October, mm. or we're waiting for that. But I think what was essential, uh, you forget to name that it was the building was also named after Martin Luther King. So, yeah. And uh, and it was designed in the. It was opened in 1972. And for me, the amazing thing is when I entered that building, first of all, if you're talking about being inclusive, it felt almost like entering, it's Mies van der Rohe, like a lobby of a, of a corporate office. Mm. Uh, it didn't feel welcome. Imagine that you have little children entering that building and doesn't have I also try to think in ages. Or, so that, that was totally unwelcoming. Um, it was full of homeless people, and uh, that happens a lot, to be honest, in the United States, mm -hmm. but even in most of public buildings. And what we said, we should first of all analyze that whole situation, because it was the, the, the homeless were really bused there, brought by bus every day, so it was organized that way. I remember now. Yeah, they, and, that's, was... uh, but also, what I always say, if you want to think, huh, it has to be inclusive, it's a building for all. The, for me, very essential is that one group doesn't um, pushes away the another group. That's yeah, a so tribalistic the... nature that Ola Tomein mentioned. We're very tribalistic, so that you know we tend to push others away that, does, that don't belong to our tribe. Yeah, but also that the one group is not so dominant that, like, for instance, the homeless in Washington were so dominant, was maybe 50% of the population entering that building, that other people, you, you don't go with little children, or hey, so it, it felt uh, unwelcoming. Mm. So for me, it's very essential that, for instance, a public building like a library is welcoming for all. And um, that's something I learned by doing the by designing the Library of Birmingham. I think that was in 2005 or 2008. I'm a little bit lost in years. Um, being aware, because uh, first of all, I said I love it's that library. Uh, uh, I said I, kept, I became a specialist in second cities. Yeah. Because what's special about second cities, they all have this uh, mixed population. Mm. It's full of immigrants. So you're looking at the Rotterdams of the world. Rotterdam, uh, Library of Birmingham, Kaohsiung. I was often harbor city or former industrial cities. And uh, there you have this, this whole issue. And so I really wanted, I call this, when I started to design, I wanted to create a people's palace, a building for all. And I, for me, that was the, for me, the switching point to be very much aware that it's for all. Um, but also in my own career, I, you have to realize I started in the 70s, uh, uh, late 70s I studied and 1980 I started my office still being a student as part of urban renewal, mm. you know, working in 
all the neighborhoods of Rotterdam or Amsterdam or The Hague was full of immigrants. Yeah. So for me, it's really I like just talking to them. And so, you know, so, so it's your second nature. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's and I love it. Uh, you know, observing and talking to them. You know, what they, imagine what they like, what these kids like. Uh, we will continue this uh, conversation a little bit later because uh, it's interesting, and I cannot stop listening to uh, you. But I would like to introduce our second guest okay, uh, here as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, don't excuse yourself uh, at all. Uh, Aminata Cairo joins us through Zoom, and she's an anthropologist uh, and a diverse and inclusion consultant. Aminata, are you there? Yes, I am here. I hope you can hear me. We can hear you loud and clear. Um, if we talk about personal identities and if we listen to Ola um I'm, I'm quite afraid because I'm afraid that we can try to design inclusive and we can try to, to take every person and every group into account. But in the end, it's an illusion because of our tribalistic nature that she, that, that, that she described. Uh, what is your opinion about that? Yeah, I don't totally agree with that. Um, and you know, and and, 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 I, and I hear that a lot, you know, like it's people's nature um, to want to be part of a group. And maybe, you know, it's kind of like a chicken and the egg kind of thing, what came first. And maybe at some point it was, our nature or wanting to be with our own group. But I think we have been socialized in a way, you don't, you don't just wanna to belong to your group. You wanna to belong to the group who has the most resources. You wanna to belong to the group who is the most successful. And often people are willing to leave their group um, or make concessions. So I don't really believe in that. And so even when we are designing for all, we tend to still design for, you know, usually a middle-class norm and then we allow some of those, but not too many. So there's still a norm and then everybody wants to belong to the dominant norm. At least that's that's the way I look at it. And but that's, that, that, that scares me as well, because you talk about social mobility, you talk about upwards mobility, but that means that mm -hmm. you would like, that you strive for something better than the position that, that you're in, but you don't take, you don't always take the positions of people that are not in your group or quote unquote, below your group, you're not about yeah. to take their, uh, their, their, their ideas into account. Exactly. You know, so even when we bring everybody at the table, does everybody's voice count the same? And generally that's not the case. A lot of times some people are invited just so we can say they were there, but when it comes, do they have equal amount of power or say so, or are their needs in taken into consideration? A lot of times, at least in my opinion, that's, you know, that's not the case and even you know, I'm in the US right now. And yes, we, when you talk about libraries, you see a lot of homeless people there. Why is that? Because everywhere else they are shut out. You know, mm -hmm. it's one of the places where they can still go. There's a reason why they congregate there because all these other places are being policed or they're being erased or they're being locked up or they're being, you know, because we don't want to see them in the public space. But that's the one place where they still have access to, you know, so, do you, so the, the question is not just about the library, but what about the larger space where that particular group is not welcome, that we don't want to see them, mm. you know, so yeah. Right. The inequality that you describe, is, we, we can recognize as that, of course. Leongo, you invited two amazing guests. Why did you invite them and what is it that you would like to know from them? Well, I, I invited Francine Hugo because she has been inspiring me from the day I was a student. Um, actually, one of the first projects I visited was uh, a helicom in uh, Rotterdam Zuid. Uh, helicop, the, yeah. helicop, sorry. Yeah. Uh, um, so, and, and, and that introduced me to Alvar Aalto because he had a, like a, simi uh, yeah. a similar kind of yeah. uh, tower. Um, so, and, and that is, let's say, um, Francine's architecture is innovative where it needs to be. So, not innovative just for the sake of innovation, but innovation for the sake of solving a, a problem, a social uh, a challenge. Um, and also it has a certain warmth. I mm. mean, in the, for instance, the blue she uses is, is, is a very warm blue, um, which, which I like, the use of color, the use of uh, uh, wood in, in, in her design. So that, that is the reason why she's here. And um, reading about her, listening to, to videos, uh, looking at videos, um, I, I got even more inspired. So and I was re really wondering, you know, how she thought about this topic. And mm. she is one of our top uh, architects uh, in the Netherlands. Right. Uh, and also, uh, 
internationally known and known for something very different than the other architects I know. Mm. Aminata. Um, I invited uh, 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 Aminata because I, I, we have to observe as, as architects, but we are not trained in observing as anthropologist. So I would like to have an anthropologist at the table to help us and to correct us where we think we have observed properly and maybe she can give us some uh, tools uh, at the end. So that, that is the reason. And then I have Ronald Snyders because um, his music was very inspiring for me when I was back when I was studying. I used music to explain how, how I wanted to create contemporary Caribbean architecture mm -hmm. because you don't have 10 books on contemporary Caribbean architecture. And now I, I have the same challenge being in these super diverse cities that I don't have many examples. So I can use the music again. And uh, I, I think Ronald also inspired some from some of the top uh, Curusolinian uh, jazz uh, musicians. So. Curusolinian jazz musicians? Yes. I I think uh, we, we, uh, he belongs to us. We're very tribalistic, so he belongs to the Surinamese <laughs> tribe. Well, well, the links between Suriname and Curaçao are very strong, I think. Uh, so uh, I have very to give good. a little bit of both. Okay, very good, very good. Um, well, it's good that you mentioned him because maybe we can invite Ronald Snyders at the table uh, right away because um, uh, Ronald Snyders is a flutist. He's a composer and ethnomusicalist as well. And he is trained as a civic engineer, so he can can bring uh, city development uh, and, and thinking about cities and uh, music together. A warm welcome to you, Ronald Snyders. Thank you. You've been beautiful words. Thank you. <laughs> You've been part of my musical uh, history for a great long time, and I had the privilege to share the stage with you as well. So thank you for being here. Um, what not people know is that you were trained as a civic engineer. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, uh, it wasn't my main purpose to study that. I, I was in Suriname playing the flute, uh, wanting to play jazz, Brazilian music, Suriname music, develop it. But, but I didn't get a scholarship, mm -hmm. so uh, I was advised to study Delft, then I would see later. So, but I loved technique because my, my, one of my uncles, uh, two, mm -hmm. my uncle Ewald and my uncle Ike, they like to make... Uh, technical things, uh, making boats, models, uh, thinking about uh, one uncle of me even built a whole car, mm -hmm. <laughs> a new car. So I was inspired by the technical side as well. And the uh, architecture uh, is something that I really loved from being a boy. The, one of the first things that I looked of uh, 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 very much around when I was in Netherlands is the fronts of the house. So mm -hmm. I was walking like this on the street always. Because <laughs> I loved to see the, the playing of the form and the people and uh, the channels. Uh, Delft is also channels, like, just like Amsterdam. So when I studied in Delft, I was feeling actually very good. Mm. I wasn't feeling bad uh, that it was the country of playing flute and writing compositions, mm -hmm. but I must say my passion is music, of course, but I've learned very much further when I was in Delft about architecture yeah. of several things, like for instance, in Delft, we have a building named the, the Aula, mm -hmm. the Aula mm -hmm. of Delft. I was staring at it very much times, and uh, I even like also, the play of the church at the market. And, and, you see? and is there is there a, a point where music, civic engineering, and maybe architecture meet, or are there two different different roads? No, they are uh, they are very much similarity. As a matter of fact, just like all forms of art that are in a certain way connected mm. with with each other, mm -hmm. uh, you do it in a certain way. But there are many things that are in common. For instance, uh, music. It's a language, mm -hmm. it's a kind of language, but architecture is also a language. You, 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 you have certain things that you would like to repeat, some things that you would like to surprise, you make uh, some places where nothing happens. Uh, so I see in architecture a lot of similarity with um, music, and dance and other things. It's like the rhythm of the rhythm of architecture, the rhythm of designing, the rhythm that you experience if you walk around. That is comparable to music. Yes. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, if you talk about music history, because you're 
you know a lot about Surinamese music as well, about music in general, but specific Surinamese music. For the people not in the know, can you tell us a little bit about the roots of Surinamese music? Well, the, uh, well, the first roots are of the Amerindians, the, 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 the people, it was their country. So it was taken by the Europeans with uh, the black slaves coming from mainly West Africa. And uh, after uh, slavery in 1873, there were uh, several people from Asia uh, uh, imported, like the people from India, the people from Java, the people from China. That's China were the first. So um, Suriname, uh, uh, so you talked about the music, eh? Mm -hmm. So the music was reinvented in Suriname. It is not African music that was uh, imported. It was a mixture of a lot of cultures from people that were mainly from West Africa that had to find own new rules in uh, in religion, in dance, in music, and so on. It was not like bringing Africa to Suriname. It was a new thing. It was reinvented. And also the language, the Sranantonga is a new language mm. that was also invented. And in terms of music, you had also some new things, totally new things that happened. But the roots of it all remained, uh, talking about black people, uh, remained Africa. But it was very mixed with... Uh, European influence. So you see a lot of Suriname music by black people is, is, is very much also European. It is European and African at the same time. You have melodies that come straight from France or England or maybe even, uh, or maybe even the Netherlands because the Suriname National Anthem was written by, by somebody uh, from, uh, it was a teacher from uh, Groningen. Uh, from, uh, Groningen. Mm -hmm. So all those things, I myself even tried to change the national item once I wrote a letter like, hey, let a man like me write a national <laughs> the anthem national that anthem. a different people <laughs> the, the, that's, that's another question, because and then I'll, I'll give the reins over <laughs> to, to Leongo. It. But uh, Kaseko music is, is specific for Suriname, and yes. Kaseko jazz is something that you specialize in. Yes. Tell us well, a little bit about that. Okay, I'm sorry. So, so it was uh, developing in new music forms, and the first one was actually the band yeah, people don't know the verse, but the banya was a kind of rhythmic music with shakers and dance. Then, after slavery, there comes the kavina music. It's named. Uh, it's, it's very rhythmic with drums and uh, dancing. And after uh, uh, the Second World War, you had a lot of influence from uh, uh, Cuban music and P and calypso music from the Caribbean. And the caseco music uh, evolved in these influences together with the much older Kavina music. Mm -hmm. And the Kaseko music, with that horns, trumpet, rhythm, that was the most popular one for a long time. Then afterwards, speaking about black music, the Kavina returned to be popular, and now it's really a mix. Right, and, and that, that is that is something that in Kaseko that that is every party has the Kaseko music, so every Surinamese person recognizes that. And even in uh, the Eurovision Song Contest now, yes. uh, Gu, yeah. who represents the Netherlands, not only involved the Surinamese language but yeah. also the rhythm of the Kaseko in his in his songs. So yes, he sings "You know my broken me" means you cannot break me. You cannot. <laughs> exactly. You cannot. Uh, you know, it is. Uh, I, I. It is very good mm. what he. Uh, uh, had been doing it. It uh, it was done already before, uh, also like me. But now, when a very popular black singer uh, does it, it it got much more exposure because one thing of the Suriname music is that only Suriname people know it, and in the Netherlands, so it was not exported to Brazil, to, 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 to the United States, and so on. So I'm very happy that Django McCroy make a choice to use at least Sranantong words with a feeling of that rhythm. Yes. Leongo, now we've got a great impression of all the three guests who are, <laughs> like I said, amazing. What is it you would like to know from them? Whoa, <laughs> where do I start? I, I, I want to continue a little bit with, uh, with, with Ronald uh, um, on the music. Um, Am I correct that uh, 
the acceptance of classical music has grown over the past, let's say, three, three decades. That first it was uh, less accepted, or, or um, I mean, within the Surinamese community. Uh, and and w can you explain a little bit about that process of that music, uh, the traditional music, uh, and that uh, the acceptance of the music within the broader society? Well, first it was accepted by by the Suriname people who played it, because music is a property of the one who is yeah. using it, to uh, say it in a strange way. Uh, but uh, it was not really accepted as something high, because music and social class have something, uh, something uh, that is so a certain type of music doesn't belong to a certain class automatically. So, uh, but. What you see in the in the last 30 years, it is now accepted by more uh, by by more developed people to say it like that, and they love to to shake on it too. Normally, normally it was not used. You had even a place named Torarica, a very known hotel, and you had an orchestra who played. American things and so and 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 uh, American singers, but when they want to have the place be empty, the dancers they play a caseco. Everybody's going sit. <laughs> now, if they play a caseco, everybody comes and dance. Mm -hmm. Especially you play songs like Mi Canto, Mami De, the whole place is full. <laughs> everybody loves it. But in the past, it was. But Not that's, that's interesting because it's also music is also part of you know the feeling of belonging and belonging is a quite yes. interesting th topic if you talk about inclusivity and we've got a short clip brought by Francine that we can watch to to see what belonging means. Let's have a let's have a look. Oh yeah. Okay. This central library here is now the biggest in the whole of Europe. I can't tell you how proud I am of that. The teenagers definitely, I think it would be nice to come in and study because they can go off and go and grab a coffee and then go back to their work and then they can have a walk about outside so they can have a break. So I think it would definitely be a great place to study. They provide facilities for young people to use, like the music department and the theatre getting connected to it. It's like it ties it all in. borrow some books and maybe just hang out there for a bit. <laughs> All these little rooms are like, it's like your own room, which you can have your own private space and no one to bother you. And it's really quiet and you get to do your work in peace. Um, an environment where um, you've been encouraged to uh, question, think, reflect and look at things, yeah. When I'm older, when I become a dentist, I'm going to be coming here because it's next to my house and I'm going to be studying in the library and it's going to be really fun because I'm going to feel like I'm at home. Yeah, amazing. Is there anything you would like to know from Francine about designing and designing the library? Yeah, um, you, you said before that uh, this was like a turning point for you in your career in the sense of realizing that it's for all the people. Can, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? That what, what has changed in your way you approach a project? So what happened in this, during this project and how did you apply that in the next project? Um, maybe it was, uh, I don't know which year, this was maybe the uh, biggest international project I did at that moment. So I went often to Birmingham and I always feel that it also feels like Rotterdam. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm from Rotterdam. And, um, but also you have to be aware uh, that when I'm abroad, I always walk. And I stay there for several days or even a week. So I really take the time to observe, to walk, to imagine who's living there, who I'm designing for, what kind of ages. You can see in this uh, little movie, it's, it's Birmingham is uh, a city of many identities, how you call this. And, um, so to imagine this, and I was amazed that you said we are thinking tribal, but what I think, what I, I, I really, I, I would like you to go to Birmingham, to my library. For me, it's, even when the building was opened, it was almost emotional. It was very harmonious. All these people sitting together next to each other in that same building. It, it didn't feel like there were different tribes mm. in that building, totally not. 
it felt that it was really for all. And um, yeah, how do you explain that? Uh, go there. <laughs> well, well I, I think what I what um, I would like to know because you can walk somewhere and still not see. And I, I'm yeah, very the, curious yeah. to know. Um, do, do you have an idea why you ha are so sensitive for, 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 for experiencing? Why are your eyes open? Because there's a lot of people that walk through Amsterdam, walk through Rotterdam, uh. and still don't realize that 55 or 56 percent of the community has a, a, a migration background. Yeah. So can you, can you pinpoint something, or is it yeah, just who you may, are? <laughs> yeah, maybe that's who I am, because I, as a kid, I moved quite often with my parents just yeah. in the Netherlands. And I always had to adjust. I lived in, in, in the south of Limburg and then to The Hague and to, to Groningen hey, because of uh, the, the job of my father. So I always had to adjust and absorb a city. And my mom was always uh, building a new house or renovating a new house or whatever. So for me, it was always... And I, 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 I loved it. So, but at that time, you know, living from um, Heerle in the south of Limburg moving to The Hague, I lived there for four years, and then lived to and go to Groningen. It's three totally different um, cultures yeah, but I at think, that time. Yeah, huh? I think, I think uh, that would explain. I mean, that's And I, I, I love it, and I like to talk to everybody. It's like also what my father used to do. So I like to To, to interact. That. Yeah, to interact, yeah. and I think it's really my attitude. And also maybe one thing, you know, I knew how to design a library, so I could totally focus on Birmingham. And the people of Birmingham, yeah. because the other part, is, is, yeah, I know how to do that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. No, but I, I think, I, and then I want uh, uh, Aminata's comment on that. I mean, I moved a lot also, and I, from moving a lot, I learned that not to judge, so to, yeah. to 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 observe and try to understand why they are doing what they are doing the way they are doing it, and and before you judge, and maybe you, of course you have your opinion, but I would like to 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 hear from Aminata what. Uh, how she thinks about it. Um, how I think about about judging. I'm not. I'm not clear about. No. I, I, what 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 it is that uh, makes the, the a certain human being more sensitive for to see what is happening around him or her uh, than the other. Um, it, it yeah. Um, I, I think it's part of what you're exposed to, and also part of. And it's interesting because we're talking about design, but also a lot of times how things are designed. A lot of times things are designed so you don't see the other. You know, a lot of times things are designed, again, we don't want to see the homeless. We don't want to see elderly people. That's, that's you know, that's part of design. Um, I, I, I've shared with you before, like when my mother's in her 80s and she used to go still, you know, on public transportation, but a lot of the benches have been removed and I've been told those benches have been removed because they don't want homeless people sleeping there. But those benches also, like for somebody like my mother, she could like almost plan her trip because she knows she can rest at those benches. Those benches are gone. So she no longer leaves the house now because there are no stops or certain, you know, so um, because so. So alterations have been made because there's a certain population we don't want to see, but at the same time that also affects another population. And, and so, um, so what I hear in my work a lot in education, I hear a lot like, oh, I have blind spots. Oh, I didn't see, oh, I didn't know. Yeah, that's, that's, you know, that's kind of by design, um, unfortunately. And, and also so like, like, like Rona, I appreciate it. Um, or, or Francine, you said, you know, you didn't see it as, as tribal. I personally also don't necessarily see it as tr tribal. You know, at one point we, we, we were, and it doesn't mean that we, don't have an affiliation with our group, but at the same time, I think we have been socialized so much more further in terms of our education, in terms of our achievements, um, that a lot of times the idea of tribalism is almost used as an excuse, right? And, and so we don't hold each other accountable to say, you know, we can mingle more, we can do more, we can make sure that there's more access. And then we fall back, oh, well, we just tribal, so people just see their own group. And I don't, again, I, I don't agree with that, but a, a, that's the, I think the challenge of design. And so even when we're talking about designing for all, that it requires something, it requires some extra effort because there's a lot of people that we don't see, but who are there, people who are undocumented, uh, who are being put 
putting these certain houses, um, what is it like a, a, a bed and, and breakfast, not bed and breakfast, but they can spend the night, but then you have to be gone because we don't want to see you. You know, you can only show up, you know, when it's dark to spend the night there. You know, that's, that's part of, um, yeah, that, that, that's part of our design. Um, so I don't know if that answers uh, the question, um, but that's kind of how I see it. Yeah. Well, it, 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 it answers a bit the question because it's, it's, it illustrates that it's a quite a very complicated situation where you have to, you know, to deal with dynamics in the city, dynamics that cause exclusion, maybe not intentionally, but do cause it. Um, and it starts with the vision of designing a, a city and designing uh, neighborhoods. Francine, you brought some renders uh, with you, rendering uh, image, uh, imaginations, uh, how do you say that? Uh, images of how a building could be. Yeah. Um, that very interesting, but why is it important to watch them? Uh, I, I just want to tell you that we were not only, when, when we did design these buildings, that this is Washington and that one, this is all Washington. We could talk mm -hmm. for hours if we did post it, because then you have to put people in, mm. that there are, you know, enough black American peoples, because uh, Washington is very much a black city. Is there enough also fatty people in it? Is there, you know, we, we should not be, because a lot of renders you see worldwide for architecture, it's all white, slim, in the 30s, energetic. No, it's for all. So we should also express that in all our... Uh, but why our, is that important? Because those renders, the Im imagination of a building and the use of that Im Im building, it's for a very select group of people. Why is it um, important No, 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 to... be aware. These, uh, what I'm showing you here, is public buildings, what are really meant for the whole public mm. and often by public money. No, so it's very essential that they feel that it's theirs. Mm. It, and, it, uh, it, it, it's very essential for people to uh, um, adapt the building as being their own if they can recognize themselves in the images of the building. I mean, we, we did the same yeah. for, for the hospital in Curacao. I spent two days on the internet looking for, for, for black... Uh, it's um, difficult, huh? we, we really... It's very, very so difficult. We had, we had all to, the, all yeah, the design all programs hardly yeah. have colored people. I mean, we had a new version of a certain program yeah. and we were so happy that Standard, they had a few more people of color because we were using all the same mm. yeah. uh, people all the time. So, no, it's, it, it, that is one of the, the biases that you have already in the computer uh, uh, design of the computer programs that we use as architects, that you'd only have a small group of people. And if, so that's... Yeah. Uh, or even Aminata, Asian people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Asian because people as well. Aminata, fit. what does, as an anthropologist, what does it mean that in our databases there are not, ima not enough images of black or diverse people, no, or, or diversity of people in the, in the, in the images? What does it say about us, about the systems? Because we talk about redesigning systems. Yeah. Well, but somebody designed those databases, you know, who, who was raised in a certain society. So even the people who put the databases together, put what, you know, what they see in their environment and what they have grown up with as who are the relevant people and who are the people that matter. Um, so, yeah, so, so you know, and, and so there's a lot of studies now about, you know, artificial intelligence uh, that is also quite racist and sexist because Again, it reflects the people who have built it and they have been uh, conditioned to look at the world and to engage the world in a certain way. But also, so, I just uh, want to say, uh, Aminata, is, there is also a client. For me, the client was really uh, wanting to do this and organize this, but also the leadership of the politicians. They wanted me to do that. Uh, so it's, they wanted you to include several kinds of people. Yeah, that right. was really part of their... And also, when I did design the Library of Birmingham, also in the... Uh, the, um, the clients, they really made sure that there was enough, uh, because the Commonwealth uh, in, 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 uh, in the UK, so I had enough Indian people and Hindustan and Pakistan, mm. you know, I had, all, I had them all. Uh, also, as um, what, what do you in say? The public outreach what do you say? Because the that's the, the, the you know the, the discourse now is that no no that's so politically correct. It's just about being politically correct now. What would you say about that? No, it's totally not. It's trying to understand. Who, for who you're working for, what is, what is yeah, it, yeah. A building for all means a building for all. Hmm. 
I think the difference is if you put a lot of energy into it, like I see what Francine is doing, then it comes out. If you try just to 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 put that that, that check on the on the box just by you know inviting some colored people at the table and just continue with your own ideas, then then it's just window dressing. Mm. But if you put effort and really talk to people without being you know trying to 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 go over your own biases then you because it's so interesting because you learn so much more and then you can what Francine said about the library she knows how to design a library but now if she understands the, the, the city of Birmingham she can create something new and that is what what we like to do as an archi as, a, as architect so it, it gives you more inspiration to create new things not having to repeat right so, and that's that's something Aminata mentions as well is that who's at the table and yeah. what you know what what role do you give them um talking about systems talking about broken systems and even repairing broken systems um there's a metaphor uh, um and you can derive that from the kintsugi method oh yeah can you can you tell us a little bit about the kintsugi method no the way uh, which, oh, oh sorry that was you that, that was me <laughs> that was Aminata, you sorry so yeah that's okay Aminata. I, 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 right let I have Aminata, to yeah yeah, yeah. And yeah, so kintsugi is, is a, a Japanese art form where you have ceramics, and yeah. the ceramics are broken, and then it's put together again, and then you know, and it, oh, but it's yeah. glued together with, with, with gold or oh, silver. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, I know it's yeah. So, so you see, so the idea is that uh, you know that there, there are cracks, so that means there's a story, there's a history, something has been broken, but that you put it together, and what you have put together is actually more beautiful than what it was before. Yeah. Yeah. And and is that is that applicable to systems as well? Can we develop a system that is better than it was, more beautiful oh, than it was before? <laughs> How do we that's go about it? <laughs> I, it? I mean, and, and, and before I answer that, and Francine, I, re I really appreciate what, what you said um, because to me, I also look at architects kind of as 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 activists, even they might not see it. And I think what you're doing is in a way like to me, activism, mm -hmm. because I think a lot of times the people who give the assignment, they might have an idea, but they do not know the extent to which, you know, when they say, yeah, we want a building for all, you as the architect can say, you don't even realize who all is involved when we saying all. And then mm -hmm. the fact that you, you know, that you've so clearly done. And so to me, even the work that I do, um, I'm a lot inspired by Kintsugi because what I try to do is I try to purposely create the cracks and purposely try to create the disruptions. Even when you look at a sidewalk, it's in the crack that new life comes through, right? And so we have this certain way of engaging the world, of seeing we're conditioned, and you try to shake that up and that when things get shaken up, then you can look at, okay, out of that, we want to create something new. But you first have to shake things up. And that's what people are a lot of times resistant to because that doesn't feel comfortable. Right. Ronald, I saw you were nodding in agreement. Uh -huh. is, is that a Katsugi method in music? Or is, is yeah. Kaseko music actually the example of Katsugi? Katsugi? Well, it's not Maybe only, uh, well, only Kaseko. I'm, I'm very broad-minded in terms of music. I, I, when I write for orchestra, for big band, also the big band of Amsterdam, the concert gebouw, uh, big band. This year I'm getting 70 in a week or so. On, on the 8th of April, there's a whole program with several music. Not, not only Kaseko, but also jazz, funk, pop, uh, world music. And, well, uh, when, you, when you do this, what they say, you uh, break it, then you try to rebuilt it. It's a very nice way of building uh, things, as a matter of fact, that has been used uh, pretty much times in music. Maybe not also by purpose, but it, but, it, uh, but it does happen that things have to be rebuilt in a certain uh, way. Uh, yeah, you have to kill your darling, by the way, <laughs> plenty of times enough. Mm -hmm. So um, music, is, uh, music is a structure. And when you have a structure, you will always have parts of the structure which sometimes you can see very clear and other uh, parts you uh, don't see at all. And, and the way you build it up can be completely different from the way you experience it. Mm -hmm. So it can be very nice to build something. You work on it, it's so much nice, you get enough money for it, and then you listen, and, and then you would look at it or listen to it, and you would say, 
Yeah, no one to say, but I don't like it so much. <laughs> what is that feeling like? I don't like it. What is it? That is a kind of mystery in uh, mankind because you see it at little children already. They can like something or dislike something. And it's very difficult for somebody who is in architecture to to come to that point that you would feel what somebody uh, likes. Or you can do something like, I'm uh, building a general purpose thing, and let's say uh, the people of Japan like bamboo, so I put uh, bamboo uh, at some places. Oh, I'm sorry. That is possible, but when you want to start from the beginning, I think it's rather uh, difficult. Uh, for, uh, yeah, but maybe, if can, uh, can I react on this? Yes, 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 because I would like what, to. What, for instance, what I try to do, because sometimes people ask me, how can you design in all these different places in the world? But for, for me, I'm very much based on, on senses. You know, and at the end, all the people all over the world have the same senses. Okay. Uh, it's about seeing it's universal. Feeling. Yeah, it's rather universal, but there's also human values that for me all over the world are the same. What color of skin you have, you want to take care of your children, you want to take care of your elderly, of the parents. Or the, There's many things you, you want uh, to develop in education or whatever. There's so many values. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you're poor or rich. Uh, you uh, want to have shelter. Yeah, uh, so, yeah, so there are so <laughs> many human values that are... Uh, and everybody has the same senses. Yeah. Uh, and also, I also sometimes explain that most people almost have the same size. Of course, it's a little bit different, but the space around it, uh, because for me, architecture is how space around uh, the human body is. So it's, the, the, yeah, it's... Yeah. Uh, do you agree with that? Yeah, well, I, I, I hear very interesting things. Um, and because you, you said about uh, when you when you create new music, you have to break it down, and yes. then you have to bring it back together. Yes. And there's a certain balance, a certain harmony that you have to bring it back together in that it becomes music. Because yes. just by yeah. taking parts of different different kinds of music yeah. and bringing them together it's not a new kind of music but you do something to it and i think that's the same you you, you ex named the example of adding bamboo but that that is so that is just by throwing it like just breaking it up and just putting it it's much more than that it's just yes, yes. so we cannot just add bamboo and then it's chinese it's just, we cannot just add color and then say well okay now it's a building that is uh, for, for for people with a migration background so it's more than that it's deeper than that and it's that same i think it's the same in the music as it is in architecture it's experiencing all those different things bringing but, them together and bringing them into a new composition yeah but it, but but it's still in in my mind. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. It's still a matter of dressing or not. Of dressing. Dressing. Yeah. How do you dress the room? What, what, what uh, the, uh, no, the a, a bamboo it, example? Yeah. You you you. Is that you, too uh, superficial? Is it too superficial? It, it's it, it's more essential than that. It's yeah. more essential than that. It's 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 about certain feelings that you want to give people. I mean, uh, like Francine says, it's about experience. It's about the experience of the space. What kind of experience do you want the people to have within that space? What kind of activity you want the people to be able to do in that space. And what and frame of reference do you use as well to inspire, to be inspired in order to create that space or in, if to, to dress that space? So it's not a bad thing necessarily to use bamboo. No, it is, it is. But it is but more than that. It's, it is, where does that decision to use bamboo come from? Yeah, see, let's, if, if, if I make a, a space um, where um, Asian people want to do a certain ritual, and the space doesn't uh, um, facilitate that, I can add bamboo to that space mm -hmm. and still it's not a proper space. Mm -hmm. so, it, so the bamboo can add certain can, atmosphere, can, can add, but yeah. it's, it's much more than, it's more about the, the experience of the space and what, uh, what, what it is that the people want to do within that space. Mm. Uh, and that is very important. And you can use the bamboo, you can use many other materials too, but it, it's about that experience. That is, that is very important. What do the people want to experience yeah. in that space? Uh, but, but Francine mentioned something interesting as well, is that sometimes human experiences are so universal that it transcends cultures, identities, yeah, backgrounds. Exactly. Um, but isn't that contrary to what you say, that you want to be very specific in certain cases in order to be inclusive? In order to be inclusive, you have to 
realize the small differences. And because if you miss those, um, for instance, uh, uh, if you design in Hong Kong, you have to make sure that the building is according to Feng Shui. If, 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 if you miss that little detail, they will not accept your, your building. <laughs> mm. And a lot yeah. of things, I mean, I, I read a little bit about Feng Shui, I'm not an expert, but a lot of them comply with my ideas on, on a good building. Some of them I don't understand, but you have to realize that you, that you have to deal with that. And if you don't, they will sometimes not even accept your building. Mm. So it, it's, it's about those little differences and you don't have to stay within the difference, in that small difference, but you have to realize it and then work with it. Right. We have come to the end of our conversation and time flew by very quickly. I would like to give everybody the opportunity. Um, what's the main thing that we should take away when we design for all, when we take that into account? Francine, what's the biggest advice you can give us in order to develop that? Oh, very important that one group doesn't push away another group. Mm -hmm. That's essential. Um, yeah, maybe that's the most important. And also, to what I often then try, it, if I do a big building, that there are different atmospheres in it. Mm. That's why I give place that people have different... Sometimes, I, like, if I do libraries, I make many libraries in a library. Mm. So that everybody can find mm. his or her place where he or she feels uh, comfortable. Right. Thank you. Aminata, same question for you. What should I be our main takeaway from tonight if we design for all? Yeah. Um... I think that, you know, so what, what, what are we thinking about when we talk about the concept all? And I think there is a wealth and a richness of stories uh, of which many are often overlooked or that we don't see. Um, and so to get to those, you know, like, like Leonga said, you know, you have to, it's sometimes about the smallest detail. You really have to listen. And so we have to learn to listen and to look for the stories that are there, but are generally overlooked and not taken into consideration. And then also the fact, again, that, that designers, we, we've talked about architects, but designers in particular, that you have a very important role kind of as the go-between, sometimes between those who give the assignments and those who will enjoy. Yeah. Uh, so, so you kind of have an act, in my opinion, you have an, an activist and a, and a change-making making role. Great, thank you so much. Ronald, from a musical of civic engineering point of view, if we design for all, what is the most important thing for you? Um, well, you have the function of something, the, the function, for instance, a library or, and, or, or, a, con or a place for concerts. You, you see, I believe there are certain uni First, a lot, but there are also things like uh, uh, styles, just uh, styles. People like to have certain styles in something, uh, and it is it is not easy to know what to do from the beginning. I had rather have some plans of some people who want a certain thing, then I would start thinking and I would like form it. If I was doing architecture, maybe I'm. Maybe I don't tell the truth because I like to compose a lot. I like to write something off of my own. But I think it's a very big question for an architect to to build something, because you yes you yes you have uh, spirits, mm -hmm. spirits spirits of people. People come together and they they yeah they add something in the place. It's something almost mystical. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a very gr big great question for somebody who built a place for people to do. If I would do it, I would at least have um, some something like you call warm. It should not be cold. People don't like only cold. But they don't care if something is a bit cold, but they look for places where they can have also warm. Uh, warm and and the place is uh, sounding good. That is also acoustics something good. that is. Acoustic mm, should be. Good. Yes, the acoustic should be, because acoustic influence people uh, uh, very much. If something sounds echo echo, people don't mm. like it. They like more the 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 sound like when you talk. 
and that, that, in that the room. suits the belonging as well. You know, the warmth, yes. the sense of warmth, the, 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 the acoustics that that you know doesn't echo, and that that yes. is compliant to belonging. Thank you so much, uh, Ronald. Yes, thank Can you. Can I ask you? to take your place <laughs> at the stage because we're going to listen okay. to your music in a, in a little moment at the okay. end of the program. So if you could take your space, that would be, that would be great. Um, Diongo, this is the final episode of the triptych and um, you're, you, you, were, uh, you still are our first fellow, mm -hmm. and, but your fellowship is reaching the final stages at the moment. Um, if I were to ask you, what are the biggest takeaways that you that you have had during your research but also during the programs what the, would that be well in, in general the, the biggest is that that we need to invest much more time in, into this topic mm. um, uh, if, if we want to maintain our cities as uh, here in the Netherlands as pleasant places to stay for for everyone we have to start investing in it. Um, besides the research I did specifically um, for being a fellow here at PACA is also what I encounter uh, with the projects I work on here in the Netherlands. Uh, due to COVID, I, I started to do much more projects also in the Netherlands. Um, I see that we are just at the very, very beginning of a process of thinking more inclusive. I mm. mean, it starts with a brief that you get, for instance, from municip well, not a brief, the, yeah, from the municipalities, where they could be talking about an area like Amsterdam Zuidoost and have the word uh, multicultural, multicultural mentioned just once and not explained what they mean with it. And I think if you want to design something for uh, Amsterdam Zuidoost, especially if you're talking about the urban design part, you have to realize that you are dealing with 180 cultures, that you are dealing with a, 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 an area where the majority of the people have a migration, and not a small one, it's about 80, 90% of the people. Mm. So you have to go and look for those small differences. Yes, they're all human beings. Yes, they do maybe 99% of the things the same way we do them, but they do certain things different. And how do you cater towards that so that they feel that they are at home in their own place, which they have created from, let's say this, that's between brackets, this concrete jungle that they changed and made it their home. So um, you have to give them that, 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 that credit at the minimum. So, so yes, there's still so much to do. And I will continue with this uh, because um, I think it's uh, very, very important. Yeah, yeah, as an architect, um, uh, it's, it was, before you started the fellowship, a very important topic for you already. Yeah. Is there some insight, because that we are at the beginning of the conversation, and that we have to talk about it more and more, that's clear. And is, has there been a, an insight in the past couple of months that you had, that you you know, in that sense, discovered? Um, well, I, I discovered that many, many of us as individuals are already working on this topic. And what I would like is to, you know, without having to create an organization, but that you, that you know about each other, that you know where to find each other, um, that, that, you know, that I can call Francine, hey, um, I, I'm dealing with this situation in a, in a, in a city I don't know. Uh, how did you go about this? Mm -hmm. Can you give me some tips and maybe, you know, and, and, and vice versa. It's, it's about being connected with each other uh, because that, and, and, and I really like the, the way Pakas is doing this by bringing people together. And now you can interchange ideas much easier because we don't I don't carry the truth Francine doesn't carry the truth we all we all carry a little bit of the truth and by by joining that together because we have to create something new mm. and and that is um, you need each other for yeah. that it's creating a network and yeah. use that network to exchange yeah, and, knowledge and also as well. Aminata of course and, oh, yeah. and also the music you know yeah. you know as an as an inspiration to to see where because um, to, to make a song is is, is, is is much cheaper than a building. Yeah. So if we can learn from, from that, then, then that might save us money in, in, in creating the buildings. And create something new. Yeah. Francine, can Leongo give you a call when he, whenever he needs Always. to? Always. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to hear. Thank you so much for being our guest again. And it, was, it was great talking to you. Um, you're working, still working on the New York Library. Part of it is already finished. Part of it is, is continuing for the next couple of years. Yes. Is there anything else you're working on that you would like to share with us? Uh, oh, I'm here in Amsterdam, so I'm working on the Nederlandse Bank. So, ah. I, so if you... Yeah. 
pass by. You can see it's been called the ugliest building. And it will be the most beautiful one. <laughs> <laughs> Just wait. When is it going to be finished? Uh, I think in um, oh I don't know in two years time, two two three years time. But right. you can see we take in a circular way because circularity is also important. Yeah. We take the, the, the tower. Uh, round tower away. Yeah. Ah. So it's really amazing how you see it's piece by piece taking away. Right, taking away. because in people in are saying that you have, we have to bring back the palace of uh, their folks yeah. flight. Is that this going to be something like something that? Something like that, but, but the aesthetics will be different. Oh, I'm very curious about yeah. it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Aminata, thanks to you as well for, jo for, for, for joining us. You're working on a book right now. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yes, um, so the title of the book is Holding Space. Uh, a narrative approach to trampling diversity and inclusion. And it really came out of the fact that um, I have a kind of a unique approach when it comes to diversity and inclusion mm -hmm. and would like to even surpass those two terms. And the nice thing, it, it, it will be coming out probably, we're looking at May, but we've done a podcast already. Some people are used it to create some songs. So there's music, there's talking, you know, so it's, it's already taking a life of its own before it's even out there. Hmm. Uh, but but um, we're hoping to have it out there in, in May. Very I'm exciting. very much looking forward to that. And hopefully yeah. you can tell us more about that in another program here in the Zwerger. Yes. So thank you uh, for that. And I'm looking forward to the book. Well, finally, this is uh, the end of this episode and the end of the triptychs uh, that, that we created together with Liongo. On April the 12th, we will start our next fellowship with London-based science studio Dark Matter and uh, Dark Matter Labs. And joining us will be Indy Johar and Joost Beunderman. So make sure that you're there on the 12th of April. And if you would like to have more information about Designing Cities for All, please go to the website of the Zwijger, www.deswijger.nl slash DCFA. And you can look back the episodes, the previous episodes there as well. Um, again, thank you so much for watching us. And we are going to listen to the great maestro Ronald Snyders.
It was a, it was an improvisation built on some tunes of mine, and I wanted to play the nice version. Thank you. Thank you for watching, and see you next time. Bye bye.